Hello. Hi. Um, let's see. Hi. Can you see me? Uh, no, I can't. I think your camera might be off. Wait a second. Let's see. Okay, there we there we go. Here I am. Mm -hmm. Um. So, uh, if it's all right with you all, I'd like to get right into it. So, yeah, sure. So, yeah, so let's start off. Can you just introduce yourself and, and what do you do? Oh, I'm Ken Friedman. Um, these days, I am a, uh, I'm a professor of design theory and strategy at Tongji University in Shanghai, and I edit a journal titled Shaji, the Journal of Design, Economics, and Innovation. And I'm also a visiting professor in engineering and design at Lund University. And then in my, uh, my other life, I'm an artist. And I've been active in the Fluxus group. Mm -hmm. um, so my first question for you is, uh, how do you define experimental art? <laughs> oh, boy. I, I don't think that there's really a definition. Um, what makes it, it's, it's sort of vague and it means so many things to so many people and different kinds of art practices are always changing. So what is just sort of traditional to somebody, maybe experimental to somebody else, but then things that were experimental a few years ago often become new new traditions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of uh, branching off of that, how do you define good art? Hmm. Again, this this is um extremely um it's always subjective mm -hmm. um so i'd be interested in hearing about how do you think your i guess sort of role as a as a professor and and designer um, how does that influence uh, your work as an artist and, and vice versa? Um, well, to be honest, I don't think that it does. Um, I was an artist for a long time before I became a professor. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that... Um, what I do as a professor influences what I do as an artist, because what I did as an artist still goes back a long time before. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that uh, what you do as an artist has any influence on what you do as a professor or no? Not really, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that it's still me. Uh, so whatever I, whatever I am or think about as an individual or my, my approach to doing things with, with, with some sense of creativity, that probably influences, it definitely influences what I do as a professor. But um, nothing I do specifically as an artist influences what I do. Mm -hmm. Who I am influences what I do as both of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, so sort of related to that, how is your art um, influenced by your worldview or, or your opinions on, you know, culture or politics or, or whatever it may be? How do those influence your art? Boy, I, I, I probably sound a little bit stupid, but I used to think that I knew a lot more about this stuff than I do. I I don't know. It's just 
art is is something that that one does out of a sense of freedom to to please oneself and occasionally to throw an idea into the world but i don't think that any specific ideas about politics influence it um after we talk i'll send you a couple of um books where i wrote about some of this over the years but um i'm not sure that i even believe now what i wrote then i just had i thought i knew more about it than i think i know now um so what if anything sort of caused your your i guess this sort of shift that uh, of now sort of knowing less than than you think you did before oh <laughs> Well, you know, the years went by and I kind of learned more about the world and I learned more about myself. So I, I, I've got a lot more um, skepticism and uh, certainly humility where it comes to what art is and what art can do. Mm -hmm. Um. So now turning more towards uh, Fluxus, what was, or what is Fluxus? Oh, well, that's, you could say, a little bit easier to answer. Um, Fluxus is a, uh, well, at least in the 1960s, Fluxus was a community or a laboratory for people who did stuff that didn't fit anywhere else. And I don't mean just that it didn't fit anywhere else in the art world. I mean, mostly it didn't fit anywhere else at all. And everybody was a bit unusual and kind of a misfit. And this was a place where we kept each other company and hung out together or communicated with each other because we weren't all in the same place. We were scattered all around the world. Mm -hmm. Um, so how did you first get involved in Fluxus and what um, sort of interested you about it? Why did you want to get involved? Well, I got involved in Fluxus. Um, you, you'll find some of this stuff also in, I'll send you a bunch of different things. Um, I had a lot of my library digitized when I moved back to Sweden from Australia. So if you're interested in fluxes, I can send you a fair amount of stuff. Um, but I, I have to warn you, um, if it's agreeable to you and you'd like to have this stuff, I'll send it. But I don't own the copyright to most of this stuff. So you can use it and read it like I gave you a book, but you can't share it with anybody or put it on the net or spread it around. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Um, then the next question is, how curious are you about Fluxus and how much do you like to read? Because I got a lot of stuff. So I could either send you a lot of stuff or just a few selected things. Um, send me a lot of stuff. And I might not read all of it, but I'll definitely try to check out most of it. Okay. I will do that. I'll, I'll send you, I'll send it to you by WeTransfer. So I'll send you some, some links and you download it to your computer. Great. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. No, but the, the way I got involved in Fluxus is <laughs> sort of interesting. I, in, in 1965 and 1966, I was at college in Mount Carroll, Illinois, at a small college. And we had a radio station. Um, and I was always doing programs about stuff that interested me. and. I went to New York briefly for a visit in January of 1966, and I picked up a copy of what was then a new newspaper, the East Village Other. Um, and in it, I saw an ad for a book by Daniel Spurry, The Anecdote of Topography of Chance. And so I wrote to, to Something Else Press, which I didn't know it at the time, but this was Dick Higgins's publishing company. And 
they sent me the book to review on the show, and I was just bowled over by it. Uh, I started to read it, and I, I just read it from cover to cover. I, I didn't imagine that anybody would have thought of things like that. I was simply stunned. It was great, or so I thought. And I made a whole program about the book. And then I got some more of their books, and I made programs about many of the books, um, read them entirely on the air. It, it was just a lot of fun. And I started to correspond with Dick Higgins. And when I went to New York in August of 1966, I went to visit Dick. And uh, he invited me to stay at his house. So I stayed upstairs in a little guest room off of Allison Knowles' studio. And one morning, I, I made Dick this little box. Um, I had actually made it several times before. It was like a multiple, except it was handmade every time I made it. And it was like, you know, these big, here, like this, these kind of big um, matchbox mm -hmm. for wooden kitchen matches. And I took the box and I wrapped it in white paper and on the outside printed, open me. And then when you opened it, printed on the bottom were the words, shut me quick. And I showed that to Dick and he looked at it and said, wow, this is interesting. The first time I'd made that had actually been about a year before. I was going to be a Unitarian minister at the time, and I was in this Unitarian youth group, and I was at a meeting in Chicago, and these meetings sometimes seemed really boring and tedious to me. So I'd always be fiddling around, making stuff, doing things with my hands. And that was the first time I made one of these. And I made this for Dick, and he looked at it and said, wow, you have to take this to George Machunas. Now, at the time, George was more or less the publisher and chairman of uh, Fluxus, chairman in a loose sense. There were never any formal elections. Um, and I, Dick called him up and arranged for me to go meet him. So I, I went to meet George, and I, I showed this thing to George, and he liked it. So we started talking. He asked me what I did. Um, there's this, I, I tell the story in, in this um, book that Emmett Williams edited about, um, about George. And I, they asked us to tell, tell some of our memories and stories. So I did. And uh, George asked me what I was doing and what I thought about. And he said to me, uh, you should join Fluxus. And I said, um, okay, because I knew Dick belonged to Fluxus and Allison belonged to Fluxus. I didn't really know what it was, but I thought it was interesting. And after that, George said, what kind of artist are you? So in fact, I actually joined Fluxus, um, you know, 20 seconds or 30 seconds before I became an artist. And George said, and I said, I don't know. And uh, George said, well, you're a concept artist, uh, which was, in those days, this was before conceptual art had emerged. So it meant something slightly different. But um, I said, okay, that's how I joined Fluxus. And I knew that some of these folks had, had been doing the things that Dick published in Something Else Press. And of course, George showed me some of the Fluxus boxes. So um, I liked what they were doing, and I thought, why not? Mm -hmm. um, how did your experience with Fluxus impact your, your work um, uh, after that? Does that make sense? Oh, well, I, I <laughs> what do you mean my work? Uh, your, your work as an artist. Uh, yeah, but this is... This is the point. My, my work in Fluxus was my work as an artist. I wasn't an artist before I joined Fluxus. 
I was a guy who thought about stuff and made strange things that interested me. Um, I was going to be a Unitarian minister. So it's not like I was an artist and I joined Fluxus and my artwork changed. Mm -hmm. That's how I found out that I was doing something that could be called art at all, although nobody else in the art world in those days thought it was art. Mm -hmm. um, so why, why do you make art? Hmm. Oh, actually, hang on. I'm just going to send you something right now while I'm thinking about it. Because this, uh, unlike some of the other stuff, I actually tell a lot of stories in here that will answer some of your questions. I'll go ahead and answer any in a minute, but while I'm thinking of it, I'll send it to you. Sounds good. Right, right away. Let me see. So what was it? What was it you were just asking before I suddenly I got was distracted? Asking, um, why do you make art? Ah, gosh, <laughs> I, I don't really know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it it was just sort of a, a free playground. And again, when you read some of these things, I suppose I had some ideas about art or what art ought to be or could do, or what art was good for. But I'm not, I'm not sure about any of that anymore. Now, if I make art, it's just really to play with something. It's play, it's amusing or fun. Um, I'm not sure if this question makes sense, but what is the goal of creating experimental art and, and how does that differ from the goal of creating sort of I guess traditional art if that makes sense or if they're different oh boy I don't know because I don't really know why people make art I mean I, I guess a lot of people have some kind of fancy idea about why they make art or they think they do or, or they think they have some straightforward idea or some plain idea but I, I'm not sure about anybody's understanding or motivation for making art um, so But you can say it's also a little bit, a little bit odd. I, I realized a long time ago that um, it was really tough. Whatever my ideas about art were, the art that I made wasn't like stuff that anybody else made. Um, the, the stuff that people made at art schools, the stuff that people made in university art departments, all this stuff they were doing. Today it's changed and Fluxus is interesting to a lot of them. But in those days it wasn't. They all thought that I was weird and everybody, nobody was interested in this kind of stuff. And uh, there certainly wasn't a market for it. And Dick Higgins said to me something that was actually uh, quite intelligent and made it very useful. 
<laughs> very, was very useful advice. He said, you know, you should be sure to get some degrees that will enable you to make a living doing something other than art. So you don't have to depend on art or the art world or art departments for a living. And in fact, this was a good idea because you could say a couple people, well, even people like Joseph Boyce, who had a pretty active market, that he made his living as a, an art professor. And Nam Jun Paik, he made, he made a decent living as an artist toward the end of his life. But he had his struggles all along. And um, he really had a hard time of it, even though he was extremely famous. Um, so as it happens, I wound, I wound up getting um, a doctorate in leadership and human behavior. And I, I, I wound up doing things every now and then it's like I'd, I'd go be a visiting professor, I'd make a little money, I'd sell some artworks, I'd make a little money, I'd pay off my debts, then I'd go back into debt, and I wasn't able to get a job in any of the art schools in North America. When I say any, I'm not kidding you. I can be very systematic when I put my mind to it. And I got a hold of a couple of reference books that listed all of the accredited colleges and universities in North America, all of the accredited colleges and universities, four-year colleges, uh, graduate universities, research universities in one book, and the other book was two-year colleges, community colleges, um, junior colleges. And I took these to a typist, and I had the typist type up a label for every art department in either of those books. In those days, that was about 4,500 art departments. Um, these days, it, it's shifted a little bit because that would be in the mid 70s and there have been some changes in North American education. Some universities have closed, some have been merged into large systems, others have expanded into multi-campus systems. But in those days, it was complete and I sent my CV and a letter to every art department in North America, the United States and Canada, not Mexico, United States and Canada. And nobody was interested. A couple of years later, after I got my PhD, I did it again, and nobody was interested in hiring me to teach art, but they thought, geez, the guy's a PhD. We need an art department chairman. So a few of them called me and actually interviewed me for chairmanships and deanships. But when they discovered that I'd never been teaching at a university before then, I never got those jobs either. Um, but I made a living in consulting. I did some publishing. I did a lot of different stuff to make a living. And when I moved to Norway, due to an odd set of circumstances, I was offered a job where my PhD was exactly the degree I needed. And that's how, at the age of 44, I became a um, professor at the Norwegian School of Management. And I did that until 2008. Then I went to Australia where I was a dean of a faculty of design. And I retired in Australia in 2014, moved back to Sweden. But in the meantime, I also was offered a job in China which I would, I would fly there and work for a while and then come back home. But uh, my health wasn't so good at one point. So I was working remote and that's been it ever since. Sometimes I go there, but with the pandemic, I can't go there. So um, that's it. So here I live in my little house in uh, Kalmar, Sweden. And that's it. But you can say, um, My take on art has been so odd that it was at that time, nobody would hire me. And these days, to a lot of people in the art world, I suppose it's like I, I, I look like some kind of um, 
fossil. It's like you, you it's like you would you would meet an extinct kind of horse or a um <laughs> not exactly a dinosaur, but a, a, a relatively recent but extinct mammal floating around. And that's I think that's how people in the art world think about me. I, I don't quite exist to them. Uh they they don't really believe that most of us, in fact, most of us aren't alive anymore. Um and a few of us who have been recently alive did very well toward the end of their careers, like Carol Ish Um Yoko Ono is still alive, so she's done very well, but uh, she's she's extremely interesting and able to organize things the way she wants. And on the other hand, once you're worth six or seven hundred million dollars, you don't need to worry that much either. Yeah. So for me, it's a little bit odd, but um, ah, I I kind of do what I like, and at the same time, occasionally, people in the art world are interested. Not necessarily that often, but it doesn't matter if they are or if they aren't. The difference is that um, <laughs> I'm in a very good position now, unlike 50 years ago when I was always struggling. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that those are all the questions that I had prepared. So um, do you have any final things to say or questions for me or anything before we part ways? Oh, yeah. What, 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 what are you doing this for? Yeah, so I'm doing a project in which I'm interviewing many different people um, about these things and then making art in response to the interviews. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> in that case, I'll, I'll be sending you some stuff. But when you, when you, whatever you make out of this interview, I'd love to see it. Okay, will do. Okie doke. Well, anyhow then. Thanks. Thank and if, if you if you wind up with any more questions or anything you think about, just drop me an email and I'll answer. Of course. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, doke. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.